we go to the word preached, let's go to the Lord in prayer for his blessing upon it. Father God, we do thank you and we praise you for giving us this time. And as always, we ask for your blessing upon uh, this time of looking at your word. Please, God, use it to transform us, to sanctify us, to help us walk in obedience to you by faith uh, more and more with every single day. God, help us to draw this, uh, help, Lord, use your word to draw us to yourself uh, to truly bring you much glory. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Alrighty, well, as it says up here on the slide, we're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 32 today. So if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open them up to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 32 is what we're going to look at. And this is going to cover the entirety of chapter 3 today. And as is usually the case, it's going to continue the narrative where we left off from last week. And so, just by way of recap, if you recall, from chapter 2 of Nehemiah, we saw that Nehemiah himself, for whom this book is named after, had been serving as the cupbearer uh, to King Artaxerxes, who was the king of Persia, which the Persian Empire was the predominant uh, empire that was in control of this entire region of the world at this time, including uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And uh, so Nehemiah was serving as the cupbearer to him, and while serving in this capacity, he receives news about the conditions that were occurring over in the homeland of Jerusalem, and that things were not going well, that the, the, the walls had been torn down, that the gates had been burned with fire, and so in his grief and in his, uh, or, you know, just in his despair over that situation, essentially, he goes to the Lord in prayer for a period of four months. And then we saw also in chapter 2 how he then gets an opportunity to actually go to the king and request to be sent back to Jerusalem to be the one who actually essentially becomes the governor of Judah and that he would then rebuild the city himself. Right? He requests this and this was a very tall order considering that, Nea, or that the king had just recently uh, decreed that the rebuilding should not happen. And yet, God, uh, and yet he reverses his previous decree uh, because, as we saw in the text, chapter 2, verse 8, the good hand of God was on Nehemiah. And so God is providentially orchestrating these events to play out well for Jerusalem. And so, with that said, it tells us that last week we saw at the end of chapter 2 how he travels from Susa all the way to Jerusalem. And uh, once he's there, he immediately gets to work. He then, it said, went out on this nighttime expedition, if you remember, of the city walls, just to see what, with, uh, what he was dealing with. And he didn't tell anybody his plans because he didn't know who he could trust. But he investigates the walls, and much of it is in complete ruins and shambles. And so he then addresses the people after this and just straightforwardly tells them that they were in trouble, that the, the conditions are actually quite bleak and bad. But he says they were not to despair, but rather to work. He calls them to work and to rebuild the city so that they may no longer be in derision any longer. And uh, sure enough, we then see that the people are encouraged by this exhortation, and it says they do in fact get to work. And, uh, and this creates a uh, disturbance amongst the other governors in the area at this time. We saw the governor to the north in Samaria, to the east in Ammon, and uh, the chieftain to the south, men in Geshem. Uh, they all get very frustrated and upset at this, and they uh, try to mock the project to try and discourage the people from going any further. Um, but Nehemiah, by his God-given, you know, just resolution to just not be phased by their opposition, he just continues to plow ahead and basically doesn't let what they're saying bother him. And so they just continue to plow ahead with the work, and that brings us right into the text that we're going to look at for today. So, without further ado, let's look at it. Chapter 3, starting in verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. Then Eliashim, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the, hun uh, as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him the men of Jericho built. And next to them Zakur, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And next to them Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired. And next to them Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, son of uh, Meshezebel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Bena, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoaites repaired. But their nobles would not stoop to serve their lord. Jehoiada, the son of Pasia, and Meshulam, the son of Besodiah, repaired the gate of Yeshana. 
They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And next to them repaired Melatiah, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Marathonite, the men of Gibeon and of Mizpah, at the seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. Next to them, Uziel, the son of Harahiah, goldsmiths repaired. Next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers repaired, and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Next to them, Rephiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. Next to them, Jediah, the son of Harumath, repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Hattush, the son of Hashabaneah, repaired. Melchijah, the son of Harim, and Hashub, the son of Pehath Moab, repaired another section, and the tower of the ovens. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired, he and his daughters. Hanun and the inhabitants of Zenoah repaired the valley gate. They rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars, and repaired a thousand cubits of the wall, as far as the dung gate. Melchijah, the son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakarem, repaired the dung gate. He rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And Shalom, the son of Kol Hosea, ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He repaired it, or he rebuilt it, and covered it, and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And he built the tower of the pool of Shelah, of the king's garden, as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Asbuk, ruler of half the district of Bethzer, repaired to a point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool, and as far as the house of the mighty men. After him, the Levites repaired, Rehum, the son of Bani. Next to him, Hashabiah, ruler of half the district of Keilah, repaired for his district. After him, their brothers repaired, Bavai, the son of Hanadad, ruler of half the district of Keilah. Next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Baruch, the son of Zebai, repaired another section from the buttress to the door of the house of Eliashim, and of the high priest. After him, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashim to the end of the house of Eliashim. After him, the priests and men of the surrounding area repaired. After them, Benjamin and Hashub repaired opposite their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Masiah, son of Ananiah, repaired beside his own house. After him, Benuai, the son of Henadad, repaired another section from the house of Az Azariah to the buttress and to the corner. Palal, the son of Uzai, repaired opposite the buttress and the tower, projecting from the upper house of the king at the court of the guard. After him, Padiah, the son of Parash, and the temple servants living in on Ophel, repaired to a point opposite the water gate on the east and the projecting tower. After him, the Tekoites repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired, each one opposite his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Immer, repaired opposite his own house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. After him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanun, the sixth son of Zelaph, repaired another section. After him, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, repaired opposite his chamber. After him, Melchijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants opposite the muster gate and to the upper chamber of the corner. And between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. All right, so that's going to be the chapter that we look at for this morning, and as we just got done reading, it is a semi-lengthy chapter, which very straightforwardly gives us all of the very nitty-gritty details of the rebuilding of the wall, which section was rebuilt, and who it was that was involved in rebuilding that section. And then it gives us the next section, and then who it was that did that one, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one, until literally it tells us of the entire city being rebuilt. And it's texts like these, as we have actually seen texts similar to this in our examination of Ezra, where basically the entire chapter is just filled with different names of different people doing various different things. 
uh, when we read texts like this in our, uh, in our Bible reading plan, uh, frankly, often we're perhaps tempted to sort of gloss over it or just kind of skim through it rather quickly uh, because in our 21st century American minds, we sometimes wonder why do we need to know all of these uh, various locations and all of these various people who did these various things. And so, it's in moments like that, as I have exhorted us before, but I will exhort us again, and I'm sure I'm going to have to exhort us again yet in the future, because we're going to come to more lists like this uh, before long. But, all that to say, what we need to remember in these moments is uh, the blessed truth from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which tells us, all scripture is breathed out by God. Right? Every single aspect of it, every single jot and tittle, as Jesus would say elsewhere in the New Testament. Every aspect, right? Not most of it or a lot of it or the majority of it, but literally all of Scripture, including what we just read in Nehemiah 3. Uh, it's breathed out by God and therefore profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So every passage of Scripture is good for teaching us, to reprove us, correcting us. Every single passage you could possibly read in the Bible uh, does in fact equip us for every good work that God wants us to do. And so if that is the truth, and it is, then the question we can ask ourselves is, what do we learn then specifically from Nehemiah chapter 3, what we just read, to then help equip us to then walk with Christ this week and beyond? And the answer that I would then uh, exhort us with is actually a principle that we have seen uh, before in our journey through Ezra. So as you know, we've been looking at various different principles of Reformation. And the very second one we uh, noted met a long time ago, back last summer, was very simply, if we desire reformation to occur in this region, and we desire for the entire community and beyond, and the church, and us as families, and us as individuals, and just continuing on as the state, and as the nation, and as the world itself, if we desire it to increasingly come into alignment with Scripture itself, and subjection to Jesus the King, then, if we desire that, well, uh, plain and simple, it's going to take people, right? This is just one of the things God does. He uses people to accomplish His purposes in the earth. And, uh, but not just people, period, though that's kind of how we worded it, you know, a long time ago. But, in the words of Doug Wilson, if you gather numerous Christians in one place and you don't do anything, well then, what you are doing is creating a ghetto, right? So... So ultimately, the goal is not to just get a bunch of people, period, and to just fill the pews, period, but rather the goal is to have people come together, and as we saw last week in chapter 2, verse 18, we desire people who will come together, who are willing and able to then strengthen their hands for the good work, and who will then truly commit and help in any way that they can to advance the kingdom of God right where they are. Right? This is the kind of people that God uses, people who are willing and able to strengthen their hands for this good work. And that's what we actually see occur in this text of Scripture. And so, with that said, that's what we're going to look at. Um, but before we actually kind of examine this and, and make some applications for our life today, like usual, uh, we're going to first now examine the text again, but kind of do it from a 10,000 feet up view, just to kind of survey the text really rather briefly. And as we survey the text again, we're going to actually do it in conjunction with looking at this map, which we looked at this map last week, if you remember, but this is a rough estimate of what the city walls of Jerusalem would have looked like during the time of Nehemiah, these black outlines here. The, uh, the shaded in green section uh, was actually the walls of Jerusalem during the time of Solomon, before the exile, but uh, after the exile, the city got reduced in size a little bit and would eventually then grow larger, you know, over time, so that by the time of Jesus, the city then had become a little larger. Uh, but during the time of Nehemiah, this is what the city outline looked like. And so what we're going to do is we're going to simply read what the text says, and then we're going to see, okay, now where are they talking about specifically on this map, just so that we can get a somewhat of a better visual idea of what this text is saying. All right? So... It began in verse 1 by telling us that Eliashib, the high priest, with his other priestly brothers, uh, got to work rebuilding the Sheep Gate, which would have been located up here on the northern section of the wall. And this Sheep Gate uh, is appropriately named because this was the gate in which they would bring in sheep to be offered in the temple, right? And the temple itself was located here. This section is the Temple Mount, the temple is there, and so they would bring in sheep through this gate and then offer it there. 
And because this was the gate that was then used for these purposes, uh, it explains then why they consecrated this particular gate of all of the gates. Because it would be used for holy purposes, for these holy sacrifices to be done in the holy temple uh, by the priests, who are all also consecrated for this work. And it's also interesting that because the priests were the ones who were to be doing this work and be using this gate the most often, they were the ones assigned to rebuild this section of the wall. Right? So that's the first section. And then, after this, we go on to see also in verse 1 that uh, the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel were then repaired opposite them. And actually, interesting, as we just work systematically through the entire text, it's going to actually describe the entire city wall being rebuilt in counterclockwise fashion. Right? So that's what we're going to see. Uh, so in verse 3, you'll notice it says that the fish gate was repaired, which was located here. And it was so named, likely, because this was the gate uh, most often used by the merchants bringing in their haul of fish. And hence, they named it the fish gate. Uh, next, in verses 4 through 5, we're told that the, uh, the wall next to it was then repaired. And again, it gives us the specific people who were assigned to that section of the wall. Verse 6 tells us that um, the gate of Yeshna was then repaired, which is here. And the gate of Yeshna was likely so named because there was actually a town called Yeshna to the west, a uh, little ways from here. Because that gate faced that way, they called it the gate of Yeshna. Well, after this, in verse 7, we're told that that tiny little section of wall then built next to it was repaired, again giving us the people who did it. And then in verses 8 through 11, we're told that the wall all the way down to the Tower of the Ovens was repaired. And this uh, is right here, the Tower of Ovens. And in all of my examination, I actually couldn't find why they called it the Tower of Ovens, though I admit I didn't look into it super, super in-depth, but I consulted a couple of different resources. All I could find is that it's uh, very generically just in the center, basically, of the western wall. Right, so that's about the Tower of Ovens. Uh, then from verses 13 through 14 after this, we're told that the valley gate was then repaired, as well as a thousand cubits all the way down to the dung gate. A thousand cubits is about 500 yards in our estimate or in our measurement today. So basically the rest of the western wall was rebuilt as is described in verses 13 and 14. Well, after this, in verse 15, we go on to see that the fountain gate was then repaired, and the fountain gate was so named likely because this is, there was a pool of water from the Kidron Valley here that accumulated in this vicinity down here, so they named the gate next to it the fountain gate. And then also in verse 15, we're told that the king's garden by the king's pool was also built, which was down here in the southern portion of the city. After this, we then go on to see in verse 16 all the way through 26. So a rather uh, length, uh, the ten verses of the chapter then describes how the wall from the fountain gate here all the way up to the water gate up here was then repaired. And it was still named the water gate uh, because there was actually, if you go out this gate here, there was a, a spring called the Gihon Spring. And it was the main source of water for the city from outside the city walls. And so they named it the water gate. Then, in verse 27, the wall of Ophel, which is the next section, was then repaired. And after that, we have the horse gate that was repaired. And again, I'm not exactly sure why they called it the horse gate, but most commentaries suggest that uh, this was the main gate in and out of the city from the eastern side. So if you're just your average, you know, person going into the city, you would likely use this gate right here. Well, after that, in verse uh, 29 through 31, we're told that the uh, wall all the way up to the corner, including the muster gate, was repaired. And that muster gate was likely so called because this is where the Jewish men would gather or muster together for conscription purposes. And then, lastly, in verse 32, we're told that the rest of the wall back to the sheep gate where it all started was in fact repaired. <laughs> So there it is, a very straightforward uh, account of the rebuilding of the city walls of Jerusalem, section by section, gate by gate, with all of the people who did it. And so, because of now having just kind of read rather quickly examined that, uh, that immediately already brings us to the principle that we, are, we had mentioned just prior to looking at it, and it is the reality that if we desire reformation, then what we see in this text is that God uses people to advance such purposes, right? We didn't exactly go into all of it in our just brief examination there, but in this chapter we are given 41 uh, separate groups of people being mentioned as involved in this project, which included priests, Levites, temple servants, goldsmiths, merchants, officials, perfumers, and private individuals. 
Right? So you've got uh, the clergy, you've got various leaders from different places, and you have just lay people, your average common person uh, from either the city of Jerusalem, and there are even people from outside the city of Jerusalem, places of uh, Jericho, Tekoa, Gibeon, and Mizpah. Right? So what we see in this chapter, again, as straightforward and as uh, basic as it is, we see that God is using all of these different people from all of these different locations with all of these different skill sets and spiritual gifts that the Lord had granted to them. That they're all coming together, strengthening their hands to do the good work to build the city. And from that, we see that this is, in fact, how God so often continues to work, even today within the church, as we've noted before a handful of times. That we are one body, the church, comprised of many different members from different locations, with different skill sets, with different spiritual gifts that He has graciously given to us, all united, though, as one through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and then when we work together, this is what He uses to advance His purposes. That God uses people. Which is not to be confused with this idea that God needs people, though, right? Because it's not like God is, you know, his hands are tied if he just can't find enough people. Obviously, that's not the case. We know that God can literally speak creation into existence just by saying the word, right? So it's not that he needs us, but in his amazing grace, he so chooses to use us all the same. And it is an incredible privilege to know that he would use sinners like us, redeemed by his blood, to then advance his purposes in the earth. And so, because of this, this is also why, as I've been announcing at the start of our service for, for quite a while now, that we should be then praying that God would continue to send to us that, the people to help, right? Individuals and entire families, laborers for the harvest, to advance His purposes right here in this region. Because, plain and simple, God uses people to do His work in the world. And so, not only that, though, not only should we then, therefore, be praying for this blessing, but there are a couple of other applications that we can actually draw out from this text uh, in specific at various different places that I would like to make at this time. So under the heading of the idea or the fact that God uses people, uh, knowing then that as a people, as a person, that God will use us, so then what should we be doing as the people of God? Three things. Number one, I would exhort us to devote yourself to reforming right where God has in fact placed you. Right? Just start right where God has put you and begin to be faithful to the Lord right there. Right? This is a principle we see quite frequently, but it's here right in the text, and so we make it yet again. Uh, as I've already alluded to briefly, back in verse 1 of the text, you remember that Eliashib, the high priest, and the other priests uh, rebuilt the sheep gates. Right? And again, because they were the priests who would be using that gate the most often, it is uh, fitting then that they were assigned that particular gate to rebuild, right? They just started right where they were, near the temple. And we see this principle again repeat itself all throughout the chapter. For instance, in verse 10 it said, Jediah repaired opposite his house. Verse 23, Benjamin and Hashub repaired opposite their own house. Again in verse 23, Azariah repaired beside his own house. Verse 28, it says that the priests repaired each one opposite his own house. Right? So not only did the priests, you know, help by the temple area, but then wherever they happened to be living in the city, they were also rebuilding the walls near that section as well. Uh, verse 29, it says, Zadok repaired opposite his own house. And then lastly, verse 30, Meshulam repaired opposite his chamber. Okay? And so very simply, the principle that they seemed to be working under was, wherever you happen to live in the city, right, that section of wall nearest your house, that's going to be your section that you have to build, right? And that's, that's what they did then, right? In other words, right, what we just mentioned a few moments ago, right? Be faithful where you are with what you have. Just consider, okay, where has God put me? And then just start being faithful right there unto the Lord. Right? This is how God enacts reformation by His amazing grace. Right? And so just to kind of press in a little bit further, a couple of specific areas in which this then applies is, number one, our family, right? Consider the family that God has placed you in, right? Start being faithful right there. And so as I've often said, right, husbands, as the head of the home, as the leader in the home, right, begin then by loving your family and leading your family, 
right? You are the head, which means God has given you the unique responsibility to ensure that your family is, in fact, walking with the Lord. Uh, you are to be washing your wife with the word, as it says in Ephesians chapter 5, so that uh, she would become all the more sanctified and holy without spot or wrinkle. You should be doing the same exact thing then for your children. You should be teaching them, instructing them, nurturing them, caring for them, disciplining them, right? You, you, ultimately, they are, as individuals, they will be held account before God on how they are doing this in one capacity. Uh, but at the same time, as the head of the entire house, God will also find the husband and the father responsible in another area or in another way for how this is in fact done. And so strive to ensure that you are doing this. Uh, it should come to the B where we can legitimately say, like Joshua, right, in the book of Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And again, we can't control, we can't make our you know, family members saved, we can't produce salvation in them, but we should be leading them in such a way that we can increasingly legitimately say that. Right? And so that is a responsibility upon the husbands as the fathers, taking responsibility, taking the initiative, protecting, providing, laying down your life for your family. And then for wives and mothers, right? also... Be faithful in the family that God has placed you in, which means that you be faithful in the ways that Scripture has called you to be faithful, right? Help your husband in this mission. God has made you as the helper or the help meet, and so help him, right? Do everything you can to ensure that the mission of leading the family is done well. Uh, this also means that you will then um, manage your home in, in, in such a way that so that in his absence, Things are peaceful on the home front, which will give the husband <laughs> peace of mind to be able to actually accomplish the mission out there. And then it will also give him peace of mind when he also returns home. Right? This is a massive uh, part of the wife's responsibilities. Also, of course, with the children, nurture the children, instruct the children, teach the children, raise up the children to know the Lord also, so that, again, it's not just from the father, it's not just from the mother, that it's a combined effort, that they are working together as a team, the husband leading, the wife helping. And then children, right, you guys also have a role in this as a household, right, be faithful in the family that God has Placed you in. God doesn't make any mistakes by the way he puts uh, people in specific families. And so what this means for you is that you need to be obeying and honoring your parents, right? Listen, uh, obey, don't grumble, don't complain, don't argue about anything that they're calling on you to do. Contribute to the faithfulness of your family. You can actually advance the kingdom of God by being faithful to the Lord. This is a really, really great responsibility. Um, and so those are just all of the, right, just in, regarding family, right? Be faithful for the family that God has placed you in. This also then, though, applies to other areas, uh, just a couple more that I'll mention, like the church. So if God has placed you within this church, and he has, then devote yourself to using the spiritual gifts that the Lord has given to you by his grace to then help one another in any way that they may in fact need help. It might just be in physical ways they need help. It might be in emotional ways that they need help. It might be in spiritual ways in which they need help. Right? Help one another to ultimately be all the more devoted to Jesus Christ. To walk with the Lord in obedience all the more. Right? We should be striving to help one another in that capacity. And we should also be striving to just help the church in any other way that we can. We should strive to be, just generically speaking, as helpful as possible. Right? Even if it comes to areas where you might not think necessarily kind of falls into your wheelhouse per se. Even if you think, I don't, know, I don't, I don't think I'd be very good in that, or I don't think that's necessarily my spiritual gift. Right? We should, granted, the Lord has given us unique gifts, and praise God for the unique gifts that He gives to then make things flow particularly well. But even if you don't feel entirely comfortable, I would still encourage us to be as helpful as you can. And when I, and I get this from the text, because I think it's interesting that in the entire description of everybody who is now building the wall, right? there's no description of any construction workers, there's no carpenters or stonemasons or anything like that. Not that there weren't any, there probably were. But it's interesting that there's no description of them. But rather, what do you see? You see merchants, you see goldsmiths, you see perfumers, like perfumers, people who make perfume are out there helping, right? Now, it's just, it's just the, the image is such that they're all coming together. They, again, they might not, that might not have been their forte, you know, but to, to rebuild an entire wall. But they said, I'm here, I'll do whatever I can, I'll pour the mortar, I'll lay the bricks, I'll remove debris if I have to, just I'm here to help. 
right? And so we should, again, adopt this kind of mentality when it comes to the church. Now, of course, obviously this is going to cost us. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us money, energy, resources. It'll, it'll, it'll be a sacrifice because, frankly, it's always easier to just kind of stand off and just not help. That's just, that's just simpler. Uh, but then Reformation gets halted. And so we should, as a church, be striving to be as helpful as we can. And then just one other way in which we can be faithful right where we are with what we have is in this community. So again, or in this region, this entire you know, vicinity within the state. Because of all the places that God could have placed you, that God could have made you born or could have transplanted you to, right? in the entire globe, he has chosen to put you in this region. And again, God doesn't do anything haphazardly. He deploys his troops with perfect wisdom and with perfect uh, intentionality. Right? He doesn't do, he's just not like, okay, just sprinkle them just randomly. He, he, he's very intentional. And so if you're here, this means this is exactly where God wants you to be, and therefore be faithful at reforming this region however you can, again, with what God has given you. And so what part of this means is that you just be a good and godly neighbor to your neighbors. It means that you be a good and godly co-worker where you work. It means you be a good and godly customer in the businesses that you frequent. You be honest, you have integrity, you're joyful, you're displaying the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and you are proclaiming the name of Christ in all of it, in word and in deed. Right? This is part of what it means to be faithful in the community. Right? And so, again, in your family, in, your, in the church, and in the community, strive to be faithful right where God has placed you with what God has, in fact, given you. Right? Which then leads to the second exhortation that we're going to make regarding this principle. And just let it be known, frankly, that not everybody is going to then be particularly helpful in this mission. Right? We're not always uh, going to, it's not always going to smooth, uh, go over particularly smoothly. Um, Nehemiah makes this interesting observation if you look at verse 5 of the text. It said, next to them the Tekoaites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their lord. Right? And then he just keeps describing the work. Right? So he's like, okay, these people did that section, they put the bars and the gates, and they, they repaired it up really good. And then you've got the Tekoaites and their nobles, and they didn't really help very much. And then you've got these people, and he just continues to go on describing the wall building. And of the entire chapter, this is the only verse where we get any reference to somebody not helping very well. Right? So the Tekoaites and their nobles now go down in infamy as the only unhelpful ones in the rebuilding of the wall. Right? And Nehemiah makes a note of it. Right? And so when it says that they, uh, just, they just didn't want to stoop to serve, that word in the Hebrew uh, literally mean, or is the word savar. Not entirely sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but savar. But it means neck or the back of the neck. And it was a common saying at this time. Uh, the King James actually translates it. Their nobles put not their necks to the work. It was just another way of saying they, they, they weren't putting their backs into it, we might say today. Right? They, they, they just weren't trying very hard. They, were, they, they just weren't, uh, they weren't stooping to serve. Right? Now, that's not to say, though, 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 that they were enemies. They weren't enemies. It's not like they were Sanballat or Tobiah or Geshem that we read about last week who were mocking the work and slandering the people to try and sabotage it. That's not what they're doing. Uh, they're there. Right? But they just don't seem to be working very hard. They don't seem to be helping very much. Right? It's like they're just, you know, kind of putting, you know, brick and, you know, just kind of maybe going a little sluggish and maybe a lot of leaning on shovel moments. And uh, it's such that, you know, the other workers who were perhaps, you know, assigned a section of wall next to them could have perhaps looked over and thought, you know, come on, to Yeah, you know, I think you can work a little faster than that. I think you can, you can be putting your back into it a little bit more. Uh, but that's just the way it is, right? And uh, so Nehemiah makes a note of it, and so we should know it as well, right? In this work of reformation, frankly, sometimes there's going to be those amongst us who just aren't necessarily very helpful in it, right? And thus, welcome to reformation. That's just how this works. Um, but we should know it uh, going into it so that, uh, for a couple of reasons, right? On the one hand, we should go into it so that we don't become overly frustrated with those people, because again, they're not enemies. Um, and so we should guard ourselves from then treating them like enemies because like, oh, they're not helping as good as I want them to help. We should, we should guard our heart in that way. We should also know it going into it so that we can then be all the more equipped to then help them be more helpful in any ways that they can be, you know, giving that blessed sort of exhortation of I think you can, I think you can be doing a little better, right, and kind of giving them that counsel. And we should also know this going into it so that we can then be periodically taking inventory of our own life 
to make sure that we're not actually being one of the unhelpful Tekoaites ourselves, because we all can become this at various times in our life. Uh, but we need to kind of be self-aware of it because we usually don't recognize it right away. This is usually a blind spot to us. Usually we don't go into any situation thinking, you know, yep, I'm, I'm the unhelpful one. I'm just, I'm just dead weight around here. Uh, no, we, we usually don't see that. All right? So it does take a bit of integrity of self-examination to ensure that this is uh, something that we're not being guilty of. And one of the ways that we can discern if we are or not being guilty of this uh, is if we just look at the text. Right? In the text, it took the form of them like literally, physically not helping very much. And it was particularly their nobles, so it might have been sort of like, you know, the, the leaders of the group who they just, they weren't really putting their backs into it. And they might have had even reasons. They might have had excuses like, well, we can't do it because of this and I can't do it because of that. There's, there no doubt had reasons like that. Um, but they just, they didn't help. Right? They just weren't being helpful. And so the way this could look today is obviously we're not building anything physically like they were, but nonetheless, in, a, in as much as in, in the same sense of realty or reality, we are seeking and striving to rebuild or to build up Christendom, right? To, to advance the kingdom of God. That we're desiring to build up reformation in this region. And so one of the ways that we could then perhaps be unhelpful is if you actually remember last week we looked at this pyramid. And we saw that ultimately our goal as a church and as Christians is to reform the entire world. That was the Great Commission, go out into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. That's the mission, right? But we know that this is going to take literally generations upon generations. Something we strive for, but that's the long, long, long term. Right? And to help win the world, then we should strive to reform the nation. But again, that's a very long-term mission. And so we then seek, again, the, 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 the goal to get to that is to seek to reform the state. But again, big goal. And so the community. And it's the community right there that uh, is kind of the more, it's still a long-term goal, but it's the more short-term goal than the world is. And so we as a church are striving to reform the community and the region that God has placed us right here in this state. Okay? So that's the goal as the church, and so to then help become aware if we are being helpful or not helpful to this mission is to then just examine all of the other tiers below that to see if we are, in fact, being faithful in those areas, or if, frankly, we've become a bit spiritually lax in those areas, right? So just examine right now, within the church, within the family, and with yourself as an individual. Uh, this might be this might take the form of you just as an individual or as a family not really being in the word very much you just you don't really read it you don't really examine it you don't really study it you don't really devote any of it to memory you're not really applying it you're not really obeying it you're not pondering upon what the word says you're just not really in the word right it might take the form of you uh, not praying Right? Again, whether it's you know, for yourself, for your family, for the church, for the nation, for the world, you might not really be making very many supplications unto the Lord. You might not be really confessing your sins unto the Lord in prayer. You might not really be praising Him or thanking Him. You're just kind of drifting through your days, a lot of the time, prayerlessly. Right? You're, just, you're not really committing to it. It might take the form of not really committing to Sunday morning worship. Right, to actually gathering with the saints on the Lord's Day to worship the name of the Lord. Right? It might be something where, you know, it's just, if I can make it, okay, and if I can't, I, okay, I guess not. It should be something that becomes a legitimate priority such that, again, it's not designed to be a legalistic thing, but it should get to the point where it's, it's, it's very rare that you're not worshiping with the saints on the Lord's Day. It should be to the point where, you know, if you are God, because naturally there's going to be things where you just can't be there every Sunday. But it should get to the point where if you're not then, people are actually like, hey, where, where's such and such? See, they're always here. Right? It shouldn't be where, you know, like, hey, is such and such coming? I don't know. It's anybody's guess, right? It shouldn't be like that. Uh, it should be something that we're truly committing to. And if we're not, then frankly, we're contributing to being a little unhelpful. Uh, it might take the form of then once you are within the church, that you're not really investing in one another within the church. You're not really getting to know one another. You're not really allowing yourself to be known because you're just in and out, never really talk, never really interact. Uh, it might take the form of then, you know, the church body even outside of the context of Sunday morning, where you're not really seeking to show or give hospitality to one another. You're not really, you know, reaching out to people throughout the week. You're not really having people in your home throughout the week. You just kind of, you're just not doing any of that. It might take the form of not really wanting to give up your time, money, energy, or resources to edify the body or to glorify Christ. 
And you just kind of, I'm just going to keep those things to myself. I'm going to just keep my own time. I'm just going to keep my own resources. I'm just going to keep all of the stuff that I have, right, to just yourself. It might take the form of you not then uh, actually living out your God-ordained role within the family, right? So as we were already referring to, it might take the form of husbands not really loving or leading their families. Right? They're just going to kind of be passive in that role. Or it might take the form of wives uh, then not helping their husbands or trying to usurp the authority of their husband and, uh, and, and, and just not really nurturing the children or managing the home when the husband's away. For the children, it might take the form of you just, you're not honoring your parents. You're not obeying the parents. You're not listening. You're, you're grumbling. You're, you're complaining about everything that has to be done, right? That, that might be what it looks like. And so, in all of those areas, and obviously we could just keep going and going and going. Uh, every one of those areas, like every single one of us have been guilty. We've all been there, right? But we should know nonetheless that if we are currently there in any of those areas, then we are, in fact, being somewhat of an unhelpful Tekoaite in the situation. And therefore, we should become aware of that so that, as it goes to the last principle, number three, repent and then serve the Lord today. Right? I mean, if you found that, yeah, you know, I have kind of been dropping the ball, you know, upon reflection, maybe I have been sort of unhelpful in certain areas. Well, then, don't despair. Don't slip into despondency of, oh, I guess I've totally blown it. I guess, no, 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 just repent and then serve the Lord today. Okay? We see this actually in the text. Uh, if you look at chapter 3, verse 11, it said this. Melchizedek, the son of Harim, and Hashub, the son of Pehath Moab, repaired another section of the Tower of the Ovens. Okay? Now, upon first uh, look, that doesn't seem to be particularly significant. However, it, what's interesting is actually this name, the first name, Melchizedek, the son of Harim. Right? This is a name that we've actually run across before in this study of Ezra and Nehemiah. Specifically, at the end of Ezra, chapter 10, there was a list that Ezra provided of men who had been guilty of taking in pagan foreign women into their home. If you remember, either they were just taking these pagan women to be extra wives, or they were getting rid of their legitimate wife and then taking in these foreign pagan women. Right? There's a, there are men who have been doing this egregious sin. And Ezra lists the people guilty. And in this list it says, Of the sons of Harim, Eleazar, Ishijah, Malkijah, Shemaiah, Shimeon, Benjamin, Maluk, and Shemariah. So there it is. Malkijah, the son of Harim. He had been guilty of this horrible crime of taking in a pagan wife and potentially rejecting his actual legitimate wife. He got rid of her. He, took the, he was committing a horrible, horrible sin. It was really bad. He, he was called out by Ezra for it. Um, and yet... Between that time and what we now see in Nehemiah chapter 3, he had clearly repented of his sin, he had made things right, and now he's hard at work rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And so just again, let it be known, if you have been guilty of any of those things that I just mentioned, maybe you're not really in the Word, you're not really praying very much, you're not committed to Sunday morning worship, you're not really getting to know one another, you're not really practicing hospitality. You're not really investing your resources in what God has given you to edify one another and to glorify Christ. Maybe you're not really living out what God has made you within the family, either as the husband or as the wife or as the children. You're not really being faithful in those areas. If that's true, again, don't despair, but rather repent. Repent and come to Christ. And rejoice in the glorious reality that when you ask God for forgiveness, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is an absolutely glorious truth. And then if you say, okay, well, I repent, and the, but then what? How do I start? Well, then, it's just a matter of, go back to point number one, right? Just start right where you are then with what you have, right? Just start being faithful today in your family. Start being faithful today within the church. Start being faithful today in the community. Just start where you are with what God has given you. Don't say, okay, I'm going to start tomorrow. I'll, 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 be, I'll go gung-ho tomorrow. No, it says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Literally, if you have to go home and have a meeting with your family about this, right? Just as awkward as that might feel, just say, hey, we've got to talk about this. And then start today, right? Don't put it off. God uses people to reform the land. And he uses people who are faithful in these ways. So, let's pray. Father God, we do praise you for your word, and we ask now for your blessing upon it in such a way that you would take your word as the sword of the Spirit, and that you would sanctify us with it. Apply all of these things that we've just looked at to us today. 
Help us to be faithful, Lord, and obedient where we are with what we have in all of these things, God, where you've put us, which with what you've given us. Help us to be faithful and obedient in our families. Help us to be faithful and obedient within the church and within the community. God, we're asking for this grace because it's not always easy in these things, God. And so we're asking for you to strengthen us and to embolden us to do this. And help us also, God, uh, to guard our hearts from ever being unhelpful, to, uh, of being an unhelpful Tekoaite or one of their nobles, uh, of being, just frankly, lazy in our spiritual disciplines, of being lackadaisical in our devotion to you and in our, in our relationships with one another. Lord, we repent, Lord, in fact, of the ways in which we have, in fact, been unhelpful or unfaithful. God, cleanse us from all unrighteousness and help us to serve you today and tomorrow and our, all, our whole life with faithfulness once again, so that your kingdom would advance and your glory would abound. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray.